So this has been a fun year. Lots of interesting activity. Um, I started a lot of the, uh, some of these slides, for those of you who are Linux geeks and interested in Linux, from uh, January this year. So admittedly, I missed a few months at the end of the year. OK. Uh, I moved to Azure, working on Azure Storage in the spring. It's been a very interesting transition. I think you can imagine from David some of the kind of cool problems. Uh, today, I was going to talk a little bit about the general Linux file system activity, then dive into the SMB uh, 3 activity, some of the cool features under development. I'll briefly mention the POSIX extensions, but Jeremy Allison and I have a talk later today on those POSIX extensions. So this will focus a lot on the features that are currently under development and the features that have been done in the last year, and then how they tie into things like you know the various servers you guys work on in Azure and Samba and every other server imaginable. So a year ago, we had our fearless coyote, and I think you've seen a little bit of the Linux drama in the news. It's been kind of interesting. Um, now we're at this merciless moray, the terrifying 419 RC5. And just for honesty's sake here, I am running on yes, uh, Sunday's kernel, so it's two days old, right? So, you know, I'm running the most recent kernel. And every year I do that, right? Linux is pretty cool. So what has been driving activity? For those of you who are at the File Systems Summit in uh, Park City this year, you maybe got a feel for some of these interesting arguments going on, or if you heard some of this yelling across the hall last night, you might have understood some of the things going on about NVMe. But some of these features that we've heard the heated discussions about revolving on NVMe, very high speed storage, very high speed networking, I.O. priority, that on top of that, the Linux File system API is evolving. Dave Howells has patches for the new mount API, new FS info API. Last year, we had a huge milestone with the addition of the StatX API finally. That was very helpful. So um, being able to return things like the file is compressed, the file is encrypted uh, in, an, in a standardized way, um, where POSIX doesn't have such flags, but now we have standardized ways to return that. File system info, not as controversial. The new mount API is. and. Um, there is a, you know, quite a bit of discussion around that. But you know, we have very basic things to talk about in the Linux world, and it's kind of fun. It, all, it tangentially touches on us when we have a protocol with five different ways to copy files. But you know, Linux you know, has some, um, what's the word for it, to do some homework we got to do in tools that have nothing to do with SMB to take advantage of these wonderful features that SMB3 and even NFS offers, and cluster file systems, and making this work better. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing to look at uh, RoboCopy and see some of the things RoboCopy can do that none of the Linux tools can do. Okay, so what else do we have to deal with? We have to deal with, remember I showed you that we mounted to, uh, through the hotel network? Needless to say, the latencies to Azure were a little like orders of magnitude worse than what we're used to. So dealing with really slow hotel networks that are maximizing at literally 0.1% of what I'm getting at home, speed, you know, this is, a, this is fun, right? Dealing with incredibly long latencies or throttling in the local network, the local switches, and then even in Azure. That's fun. And then having to coexist with all these other weird objects like, okay, so what's going on in the Linux kernel since, uh, since uh, the new year? 3,000, almost 4,000 file system changes almost 7% of the kernel. Now, I think some of you guys were at the talk earlier uh, uh, on Monday where they were talking about the block storage activity. You can see block storage is a little larger than file storage and overall activity because of the diversity of hardware they deal with. But file systems are extremely important, and these are some of the most watched changes, the 7% of the kernel. A huge percentage of the kernel is architecture or hardware specific. These tend to be more generic. Um, the kernel overall is you know, almost 20 million lines of source code. Um, I measured that, uh, I think, Friday. We have more than 60 file systems. But what's interesting about this, there's about seven that get a lot of love. And in the list, if you measure them by you know, uh, numbers of chain sets, uh, the SIFS SMB3 driver is number four, most active of the 60 some plus. In terms of lines of code, it's a little bit better than that. It changes a little more lines of code than that. Um, What's the most active? Most of you guys wouldn't know this. Most of you guys wouldn't recognize that the most active file system is BTRFS, not XFS, uh, although XFS is very high up there. Um, they get far more activity 
then, you know, I don't know how many of you guys use Android phones, but, you know, the ext 4 on your phone doesn't get much activity. It's a more minimal feature list. But it's kind of cool. So BTRFS, XFS, and the VFS, but um, right after that, you see your SIFS driver, right? Now, that is huge increase. That's more than doubled the amount of activity than usual. And why is that? Because there's finally this convergence of cool Azure features, new things the Mac is doing, new things going on in Windows, and we're starting in Linux to catch up with that huge feature set. And we're probably a thousand patches away from, from making me happy because there's so many cool features to implement still. The Linux kernel driver is almost 50,000 lines in the kernel, but it's very heavily watched, and then it's got user space code as well. Now, let's, by contrast, one or two of you guys work on Samba, or three or four, but there's a number of Samba people here. How many change sets did you guys have? Wasn't it something like 4,700 last year? Something along those lines? You'd know, probably Volker, but, you know, it may be almost 5,000 change sets that Samba had. The NFS kernel server, you know how many change sets it had? See that? 72. The file server world here around SMB3 is really active. And it's not just the Macs and Azure and everything else, it's also um, Samba. So it's kind of cool for me to see all this excitement, all this background, so it helps drive why we're doing these features. And we get some really cool developers to work with. So here we are at Park City um, in the late spring. Very talented group of developers, some of which you see here uh, at the event here. And at the Samba IO Lab, I think you guys see some familiar faces um, among the people here. You know, these back-to-back -back test events, the ability to be driving features with very talented developers is a lot of fun. So what's our goal? Our goal is to make SMB3, SMB3.1, one the follow-ons, the fastest, most secure way, general purpose way to access file data. Whether it's in the cloud or on-premises, virtualized, we want to implement all reasonable POSIX semantics, all reasonable Linux extensions, so apps don't have to know they're running on SMB3 mounts. Now, what's the problem? We also change Linux. Linux is not a, it's not a standards body that takes 10 years to get something through. Linux is changing its API every kernel internally. Now, they do this in very clever ways, but the kernel is changing every release. And we have to deal with that once a year, roughly. We got lots of features, lots of features to deal with that come out every year that are new, and that may affect the protocol. But our goal is to be able to quickly address those and not have the sort of a typical standards curse of waiting five to seven years to get the feature into the spec, into the implementation. Now, what have we done? Last year, we talked about SMB 3.1.1 support, full 3.1.1 support. And it's Aurelion's fault, right? This is your fault? Didn't, didn't, you, uh, didn't you finish off the remainder with METS? Didn't you finish off the 3.1.1 support with METS? Yeah? So it is your fault then. So full 3.1.1 support since last year. It's no longer marked experimental as well. The StatX API, we can return compressed and encrypted these various flags that aren't in POSIX. That was implemented. The performance has substantially improved, unfortunately, whereas Ronnie, we need to blame Ronnie for some of this. Um, the RDMA work that Long Lee and others have done has been amazing. The improved POSIX compatibility that Jeremy and I will talk about, various security improvements, uh, you know, be able to turn off SIFs easier, multi-dialect support, and snapshots. These are some really cool things that we talked about last year at some earlier events. Now they're in. So it's been an exciting work. Much faster, much more secure, and lots of new features. And finally, after many years, POSIX extensions are partially checked in. And we've made huge progress on those. So let's talk about some things. David mentioned direct releases. These are a big deal in things like Azure with Linux clients, right? Because you want to re re um, Reduce the number of round trips. Now look at this mount. 35% fewer frames are sent on fewer round trips. Now, why is that? We're caching the root file handle, among other things. But notice here, not only does, you know, we have SMB311 working, but we also have fewer frames being sent. One, this 35% on mount is a big deal. As we extend this, we should be able to cut this this, the, the amount of traffic, probably close to 40% for a typical, or 50% for a typical customer. So encryption works. That's nice, right? When you mount to Azure, they default to requiring encryption. You don't want these people in the hotel, you know, looking at those password files or scripts or whatever you sent, that resume or whatever else. All of those things are encrypted when you're mounting to Azure. 
Notice the seal mount option works, encryption works. Seems like a minor thing, but it's very important. Okay, the other thing is, you know, when, you t when you call up a place like uh, Spectrum and you say, you know, why are you blocking 445? It's like, oh, SIFS is insecure. Well, this isn't SIFS. One of the things that's important, a message that you hear some of the people at Microsoft talking about, Ned and others, find ways to disable SIFS. There has been a lot of discussion about how that's done to force uh, you know, SIFS to be turned off. There are multiple ways now to turn off. Notice we can, if I mod probe SMB3, it will disable the legacy dialects. If I, in, if I mount with disable legacy dialects equals one, it'll disable SIFS. So I can't put in verse equals one. Notice the invalid argument there. I, get a, I try to put verse equals one, invalid argument. We can make the kernel module, we don't change much code, but we, um, if you, in the kconfig mark, you want to disable legacy dialects, the sifs.ko won't allow you to put in verse equals one. So there's four ways now. You know, if you mount dash tsmb3, you're not gonna be able to put in verse equals one. So we have four different ways now to disable sifs. So hopefully those people who are worried about WannaCry, worried about SIF security are happier even with Linux because there's so many ways to disable it and force you to use more secure dialects. So one of the things I was most excited about was at the file system summit, the XFS developers showed me this thing called ftrace, uh, trace-cmd. And you can, if you go one level above here, in sys kernel debug tracing events, you can see all of the modules that are currently loaded that, that support tracing. And there's you know, like 100 of them on a typical system. You go one level into that, and you can see each of the individual trace points. So if you type trace-cmd trace record-e in the name of the trace point, you can turn on just that trace point. This is very useful dynamic tracing. It has very little, if any, overhead until you turn it on. Here are the ones by default that are set up for um, SMB3 and for your debugging. You know, If you're debugging a server or whatever else, I'm perfectly happy to add you know, 50 more. XFS has so many of these. Um, as an example, you know, we might need to add one that deals with um, you know, some of the problems that Jeremy and I were debugging today that had to do with um, you know, the return code in certain places. We have many trace points that's meant to add many more. What's nice about this is it's very easy to turn on and off individual things. One of my favorites is slow response. So we have a, a way of setting uh, in your uh, your module parameters at runtime, you can set what slow means to you. If, you. if you're concerned because something takes more than 10 seconds, set it to 10 seconds. Every slow response will log the mid, will log the, all the information about that request. So it's fun. Okay, so here's an example. Trace hash to TMD start. Um, we're gonna mount, we're gonna get access denied. Now look at the output. Look how easy it is to read. Very, very easy to read. Okay, now look at stats. We trace, so if you have a server, you're trying to debug server responses, notice that I tell you which command type is slow. By default, that's one second. That's kind of cool. I tell you that bytes written and read, read and written, these can be reset now, it works better for SMB3. I tell you the failed commands by type, by share. These stats can be very useful for developers. Okay, StatX, we talked about StatX. Dave Howells added this last year, finally, after many years. Look at uh, how it's returning the creation time, and some of the, uh, you can see it returning uh, you know, the attributes here. So the attributes being returned um, allow you to avoid having to use SIF-specific mechanisms and be able to use uh, generic Linux calls, StatX, to get, um, and also notice that real X adders, um, you know, you have the creation time down there at the bottom. We have some SIF-specific ones for creation time and for the DOS attributes, but it's nice to be able to return them via StatX as well. Okay. So let's talk about what happened by release, uh, going back a year. We changed the default dialect. That was a big change a year ago. Moving to SMB3, it broke a lot of things because the POSIX extensions for SIFs are no longer enabled and it's SMB3, not SIFs. Uh, we added support for the SIFs ACL uh, mount option. The default dialect was changed to multi-dialect one release later. So by default now the SIFs client sends 302, 3, and 2.1. And after feedback from other people, I'd like to add 311 to the default list of dialects uh, fairly soon if it's okay with others around here. Currently, we offer those three dialects by default. That changed in 414. Um, 415 was, was minor. Activity ramped up a lot starting at the beginning of the year. Um, so 
the SMB Direct, SMB3 RDMA was huge. And I want to show you some performance numbers you're not going to believe later, some amazing performance numbers uh, from Long Lee. Um, last year, he talked a little bit about that at the SNEA conference, and it looks great now. Um, fast forward to 417 in June, um, the SMB311 encryption uh, pre-auth integrity was added, and that was when this important SMB311 dialect um, changes came in. So if you fast forward to uh, August, much more improved RDMA performance, and then we, we have the initial set of POSIX extensions going in. So you can test creating a file with a mode, creating a directory with a mode, you get the rename and unlink semantics. You get the ability to deal with case sensitivity and, uh, um, you know, the pos so things going out from the client are request POSIX. We don't parse back the mode. We don't read back. So a stat wouldn't return the POSIX output. But the things we create are created correctly with the right mode, and they get the POSIX semantics that going out. Uh, this solves a lot of problems, and it is experimental. It's not turned on by default. We do it on purpose to allow you to test it. And what was so exciting was downstairs, there were other people, not just Samba, that were testing this with their servers. So it was kind of cool um, that we do have a minimal amount of this that's already in. And um, you, know, you can run it on a current 418 kernel. So we can disable the less secure Daleks. We talked about that earlier. Um, the F trace was added. And caching the root file handle and reducing the redundant opens improved support a lot and was due to some very good work by Ronnie. Um, trying to hide back there. In 4.19, so um, you know something you'll see in uh, three or four weeks, uh, we have snapshot support, so you can mount a previous version read-only and compare your different versions of the same thing with, you know, slash mount, slash mount one, slash mount two, different versions of the same um, same volume. Uh, we added support for SMB311 ACLs and SMB311. Um, Compounding, so you'll see compounding in StatFS. So this is a uh, a lot of work Ronnie's been doing on trying to optimize the number of round trips. This was the first example being able to do a stat-f, where we use compounding. And in 420, you'll see much broader use of that. So we also created an alias. So we had these special X adders, these pseudo X adders, for things like um, we saw it on a previous slide where you had the the creation time and the DOS attributes. Now we have an alias for them, so you don't have to use the evil word SIFs. A lot of people are telling us don't ever use the word SIFs because people are so scared of that word. So now you can do a get a, you know, SMB3. Um, and a lot of cool bug fixes. You know, there are fun, fun things like, you know, to go through certain firewalls, you had to pass the host name, not the IP address. It seems small, but important. Um, you know, backup intent used by people doing backup over SIFs. So what we're expecting in 420, which um, should open up in about three weeks and um, uh, close in uh, ship in December, uh, it says 27 changed, so I think it's about 50 now. Um, the RDM, um, we have additional RDMA improvements, which I'm going to show in a uh, slide coming up. The SMB3 one won't work that Jeremy and I have been fast and furiously working on downstairs much better compounding. And this is incredibly exciting. We have some slides on this. We'll talk about the work Ronnie's been doing. Um, and some multi-channel things uh, probably won't make 420 right. They're a little bit risky. Yeah. But, but it's some of the work Aurelian's doing. Um, there, we've bumped the, request, the default read and write size up to 4 meg from 1 meg. Um, I think this, the measurement I got was uh, the best case was 13% faster for large I.O. But typically, I was only seeing about a 1% improvement with moving the I.O. size larger. But there are cases where you can get as much as 13%, and maybe over faster networks more still. Um, but it doesn't hurt, this larger I.O. size. I found one case where it hurt um, out of many. Uh, support for Windows Simlinks actually is already there. Um, the Windows Simlinks uh, work. The NFS Simlinks do not, um, are what we're fixing now. The NFS reparse points for FIFO uh, special devices. The NFS style Windows sim links don't work, but if you use the MK link tool in Windows, that already does work. Uh, and then an alternate way to store the mode. Windows Mac has this special ace with the mode encoded in the SID um, that will allow us to, uh, to be a little more compatible. If you look, we need some help in Bugzilla closing out some old entries. We found one last night where you had sent me a patch, and I had missed it for one of these bugs. So um, there's two ways to open bugs, and they need a little bit of love to 
to close out the old one so we don't get distracted. Like I said, we just yesterday I found one where you had a patch a few months ago to fix something that should have been merged. Um, we want to get this down to a small number of five or ten. So um, we pay more attention to these. And, and a separate category that may be larger is for each XFS test that fails, we want to have an open bug to track it so it's easier to deal with. And right now there's a number of them that have missing features. And so we should uh, have an easy way to tag those and find those where um, the additional feature, maybe it's F-allocate related, maybe it's case sensitive X adders or whatever POSIX feature. So we're not confusing them with real customer bugs. Most of these don't concern me, but there are two or three here that do. Okay, so what about the new features? You know, SMB3 is a lot better than before, and it's really cool. So let's talk about SMB Direct for us, because the fastest performance is, you know, it's fun. So in his test environment, he's running with these uh, older Mellanox cards, and, you know, 40 gigabit. Now, this is an interesting test environment. So he's running with standard Windows 10 client. He's also running with Linux. In Linux, he's mounting with RDMA, so we're not doing multi-channel. Um, it's a little different than Metz's approach, but this, this is in, mostly in the current kernel. Um, and we're comparing with, with Windows, which does a phenomenal job of RDMA. So let's look at some of these numbers. So at Samba XP, a few months ago, um, he was able to present some pretty good performance numbers. Now on the left you see Samba XP, on the right notice it's taller. These are the numbers with the current, the current code versus what was not that many months ago. Notice the faster performance on the right for the different I.O. sizes. Now let's look at right. Significantly better performance today versus what he demoed at Samba XP. Close to 100% utilization in many cases, especially for the larger I.O.s. Now let's compare that to the Windows client, which is heavily optimized. Notice the, notice the very small difference in the orange and the gray between Linux and Windows until you get down to you know, the 64K and the, and the smaller I.O. sizes where we have some work to do to optimize. But this is close to 100% utilization. This is incredible. This is really good utilization that we're able to get near 100% utilization, almost as good as Windows, for you know, these moderate I.O. sizes, 256K and up. So this, I think, is incredibly good news that the read and write performance over RDMA and SMB is fast enough that, at least for some workloads, this is probably the easiest way to use RDMA. Much easier than some of the things that have been talked about in other presentations. Literally all you have to do with long lease patches is type mount dash t sifs, you know, dash o RDMA. And it's really simple to connect over RDMA. And with multi-channel it'll be even simpler still, but the performance is quite good as long as, notice the orange to the, as long as the I.O. sizes. And of course, you know, with 16K and 64K we have some homework to do to improve the performance there. So what if you want to compare backups? What if you, you know, were worried about you corrupted your presentation and you wanted to go back to a previous version of it? Well, Azure supports snapshots, but, I mean, you go into the server GUI and you click on create a snapshot, and it's fine, but how do you get it? How do you view it? What's been nice is being able to do that now in Linux. So here, if you look at the upper one, mount one, Notice it has snapshot and a long number that represents the, the uh, UTC time. So we got that from a user space code that enumerated the snapshots. So we have an ioctal that enumerates the snapshots. And we pass it on a mount. So mount one is going to be read only. Mount two is the exact same share, but it's the current read write. Now look at, look at the difference between the directories. You have mount one and mount two. Mount two has the newer files, and mount2 has the file that's not in the snapshot. You can see it's not in the snapshot. So we are able to compare mount1 and mount2, same, same volume, one a previous version of it. It's very easy to go find that recovered file and go deal with it. So anyway, it's a, it's a fun way to do it. Part of the reason I'm doing it this way is because unlike in Windows, I don't have a way to go in GNOME and force it to pass something on open to me. Since I don't have any way to force open to pass me the snapshot, I can do it on mount. And just, okay, we talked about the, the R size and W size increased, went to four meg in the 420 kernel. 
So come December, we'll see larger I.O. on average, uh, if your server supports it. If not, it just falls back to whatever the maximum you have is. Compounding. Compounding is extremely exciting. Um, I need to thank Ronnie for some of these slides. Um, it helps us to get slightly better POSIX-like behavior, but it also improves performance a lot. We have about 10 places where it's in now. I think we could easily double or triple that. What do you think? Yep, exactly. So an example he gave earlier, scanning directories in one round trip. If we do open query dir and then query dir again and close as one round trip, that saves not just the open and the close, but it also saves having to repeat the query dir, which is 98% of the time going to get a no more files. So it's kind of cool. Even something like read dir, adding to this list will increase performance noticeably for that very common operation, ls, for example, or going into the GUI and listing your directory. So let's look at some concrete examples. So in the 419 kernel, uh, we have query fs info, stat fs. So that cuts over half the frames if you're doing you know, a stat dash f. You want to see how much disk space is available. But what about the 420 kernel? In the 420 kernel, um, if you do touch, you want to update, update a file goes from six round trips to four. If you delete a file, it goes from five round trips down to two. If you m create a directory, six down to three. If you remove a directory, six down to two. If you rename a file, it goes from nine down to five round trips. If you do a hard link, it goes from eight down to three round trips. Symlink, using the Mintral French symlinks, the Apple style, goes to 11 down to nine. And query file info goes from six, which is extremely common, goes from six down to two. So you did a stat, for example. Um, extremely common, goes from six down to two. That doesn't always mean, so just because it went from six down to two, it doesn't mean that it, you know, you save 67%, right? But in many cases, it's pretty close because the network processing, the interrupts, all of the, the, the amount of time it takes to process those uh, and the network latency goes way down. So what does it mean in a real test? So I asked Ronnie and Aurelian and I tried various things, right? So it was fun. Yesterday, I think you tried two, right, Ronnie? Yeah. So here's two examples. XFS test 13, just a typical test. Used to take 171 seconds. You know, he's running it to a remote Windows server. Went down to 115. 87 down to 47. Obviously, these aren't the fastest VMs that he's running to, but um, you can get faster if you're running locally or if it was a local host. But that's, you know, gives you an idea. That's pretty good. We're talking, you know, somewhere 30 to 47 percent faster. Um, but what I thought was kind of cool was he tried it to the same server with NFS, which took, which, which was, you know, 156. So NFS was faster, but with compounding, we're now 25 to 30 percent faster than NFS was, and this wasn't what we expected. We expected it to be about roughly the same as what NFS was. But the first, you know, two ones we tried here, it was actually faster than NFS for that one. Um, but, yeah, and we're just starting. This is the, you know, we did the one for StatFS as a toy in 419 and 420. We have these 10. We've probably got another 40 or 50 more examples we can compound. But just that got us, you know, 45%, 46% improvement and faster by a lot than NFS for some of these same cases. So I thought that was kind of fun. Um, now here's the, the gory details. The one in, that's in the current kernel, 419, you want to do a DF, a, a stat-f. Here's what it looks like on the wire. What do you do in the API? You create the requests. You get the I.O. vectors. It's fairly simple to manipulate. You've got a create that's in the first I.O. vector. You've got a query info in the, in the next I.O. vector and a close in the third. Your, each I.O. vector is sent down to the stack, very efficient. Network takes care of the copy. You send off the request with this single call, compound, send, receive. Each I.O. vector had your separate, you know, open query close. And, you know, it's much, much faster. Now let's talk about what multi-channel. If we can get multi-channel in addition to this, even if you only have one adapter in the box, we'll see some speed up. Uh, if it's RSS capable, you'll be able to do more copy offload, especially of these larger frames. So Aurelian did at the uh, event last week, he made a lot of progress. And here's a, a Wireshark trace from, from him from last week. If you look at the bottom half, the bottom half, you see the negotiate and session set up. 
This is the second channel. This was the original channel. You're seeing the, this, create, this find happened on the first channel. This create happened on the second channel. You know, there's still some work to do on this, and it's probably not going to be ready for 420. But this is so exciting because even with only one adapter, it gives you additional performance benefits. And you know, it ties in well with RDMA as well. So there's also some possibilities that'll help with, uh, with HA, you know, being able to deal with new adapters being removed and added. So resilient persistent handles are supported. We use it to Azure, that's great. Yes? So the claim, so the question was, you get better performance with a single network adapter. The claims that Microsoft had made, uh, which I have not personally verified recently, was that with RSS capable adapters that do the processing, you know, some of the, the offload, the network offload, the RSS capable adapters, which is a bit that comes back in the, the query network adapters info, that it's that setting up two connections to the same server from the same client ended up with better performance than one connection to the same server to the same client. And um, they gave some, some interesting reasons to it at SCC, I think maybe Tom Talpy two years ago, and then also three years ago I think it came up. It, it is logical to me, and I would like to prove it. I think, Aurelian, do you remember the, the reasoning? Uh, also I think server control with live clients, I think. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the throttling that's going on, but I think also the, the bigger point is that it's more efficient use of the network adapter. It allows you to not bottleneck as much in some of the, um, the processing of copying the frames onto the wire because you're better utilizing the network adapters. One core, the single neck binds to a core. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So a single neck binds to a core, so this, you're able to use more cores. Um, it's a really interesting thing to explore and of course, we can make this adaptive. There may be cases where more than two is helpful. And one of the problems is there's such a wide variety of network adapters. But generally, it seems like Windows attempts to create more than one connection if it's RSS capable adapter uh, on both ends. And um, one of the things I'm very excited about is proving that on Linux, we get the same benefits that Windows was seeing with opening up uh, multi-channel, even when you only had one adapter. But of course, you know, in this world, we have lots of cases where we have multiple adapters as well. And I'll just tell you my home experience. I got one of those really cool NVMe drives, $500 off Amazon, two gigabytes per second. I need more than one adapter, or I need a faster adapter, right? I mean, I, I can't uh, without multi-channel or without uh, you know, a faster adapter um, use all the bandwidth on my, my disk drive now. So it's, um, it's kind of cool with this incredible revolution in disk drive speeds with NVMe. Okay, there's a lot of reconnect, there's a lot of homework we still have to do that relates to, and uh, you know, let's be blunt, Azure is painful. Because when you have long latencies and you have network connections in hotels that go down more often, you find error paths that you wouldn't have found mounting to a Mac 100 feet away or mounting to a Windows file server or a NetApp file server or an EMC file server. Mounting to something through a hotel network to Azure, you find a lot more reconnect issues. So we need to get the lock sequence numbers um, sent. We have a couple cases where we're returning E again back when we should just be retrying it, uh, where we've returned E again to the user. There were a couple cases where we were crediting incorrectly uh, to the wrong session after failover. Um, Maybe the witness protocol would help in some of these. Uh, there's also the ability to share redirection with the new tree connect context. We ought to investigate more. Um, Aureliana talked about the DFS example where you have more than one DFS referral, being able to fail over to that. There's a number of uh, resiliency improvements that go beyond just having persistent handle support that may, uh, that may help. But there's been a lot of progress in this. Uh, last year, Citrix did some good work and helped get us closer uh, but I think what we're seeing now is, is additional corner cases that we just have to keep drilling down. ACLs, you can do the SIFS ACL mount option in SMB3. One of the problems I'm seeing with the SIFS ACL mount option is let's say that you want to Chamad 444, so you set the read only, whatever. Okay, maybe that'll work, maybe not, but what happens a lot of times is you, more complicated things, the inheritance will change the ACL 
So you thought you were setting it to 700 or 755 or something, but it ends up because of inheritance getting set to something different than you expected. You set the correct thing across the wire when you did the chmod with Sif's ACL, but it, the server changed that in the ACL. So um, I think Sif's ACL has less utility than I had hoped, and, and I like the idea of the emulated ACL that we see with uh, uh, you know, the Windows NFS server. I think Mac can do it as well. But uh, with the POSIX extensions, we're going to be actually seeing the correct mode bits back. And with the emulated case where we're sending uh, encoded uh, mode in the SID, like you see with uh, the Windows services for NFS, you know, we'll be able to at least more accurately reflect what the client thinks the ACL should be. Of course, on the server side, it can still enforce whatever things it feels like, and we have that in Linux as well. You could have 777 permissions on a file and get denied in Linux, in Windows, and anything else, right? You can always have full permission and get denied. But I think that it's important for us to be able to accurately reflect the POSIX semantics the user expects. And that, you know, there's a couple ways to do it. But SIF's ACL doesn't quite get us there. And I think that the approaches that, uh, you know, the Windows NFS emulation, I think the Mac also supports, is going to help get us closer with being able to encode the full ACL, sorry, the full mode, including the sticky and hidden bits uh, in the, uh, uh, in that special SID. Okay, security features. SMB 3.1 is, no is no longer experimental. We'll probably include it in the dialect list soon. Uh, the default dialect, we only negotiate one um, encryption mechanism, CCM. We should negotiate GCM. I don't think Samba does either, right? I don't think, Jeremy, you don't, uh, you don't do GCM yet, right? Not sure. Yeah. Mets, do you remember? We have that implementation, but as it's Yeah. Okay, so his point was a, a good one, that, that, that Samba had an implementation of GCM, but it wasn't faster because it didn't, it didn't use the, the hardware uh, features directly. And so in Samba, in user space, uh, unlike in Windows, um, the second encryption mechanism, the faster one, is turned off. So one of the things I've been looking at is whether or not, you know, being able to use the hardware-enabled features in the kernel whether I should turn on GCM for the kernel driver, even though Samba doesn't support it, uh, to see if it gets better performance than CCM. Got a little bit of homework to do for that. But currently, CCM is what we use by default. OK, so this is a super exciting thing that, that uh, Ronnie and, uh, and actually Aureliana have been experimenting with, the pass-through IAPTL. So being able to pass through a query info is incredibly useful. So um, the query info pass-through allows us to Query the ACL. Um, I should have included the slide. I'm not sure I did. What um, he gave an example of just you know here's what the here's what the I mean there's so many things that come back besides the ACL that I find fascinating. You can return all of the metadata on the file basically. This is really cool, and you know whether you wanted to return auditing information in the future, whether you wanted to return the ACL, whether you wanted to return unusual metadata that has no POSIX equivalent. There are cases where you need that little utility that can dump out that information for the file and for the file system. And Aurelian's played around a little bit with some tools for that. And similarly, we're looking at a pass through FSCTL. So let's say that Azure or the Mac or REFS or some cluster file system running under Samba adds an IOCTL, an FSCTL, for some important debug information or some important metadata information or policy information that tools on the client need to access. Well, got to pass through IOCTL that'll let you, in user space, write your little 10-line piece of Python code that queries that, pulls it back, and displays it. And this comes up a lot in debugging, but it also comes up uh, for backup utilities. And you know there are other cases as well where the user needs to figure out, oh, why is that quota? Oh, I have a quota, you know, and be able to see the quota information. And you know, Ronnie had a good example of that. Um, I, I should have included that in the slide here. Okay, so the StatFS integration and the new MAN API, we need to go into Al Vero's tree and look at that and, and make sure that the SIFS piece of that looks good. Um, that's some work in progress we've got to do. Um, we should have an eye off to list Jeremy's favorite topic, alternative data streams. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying that we, we can already open them, by the way. We can already open alternate data streams. You can just, you have to turn off POSIX name mapping because colon's reserved. But yeah, you just open file colon stream and it works with POSIX mapping turned off. But 
uh, knowing which ones are there and listing them, we need to, um, we have a patch for that, but include that IOCTL. Uh, at some point, we ought to have the witness protocol inter integration. The multi-channel works in progress. There's a lot of performance stuff that's ongoing. Um, the POSIX extensions, I'm going to defer a little bit to the talk that we have following this, but I just wanted to kind of give you an example here um, that, you know, if you look at, um, you know, the typical mount here, the one below, MNT, is mounted with POSIX. The one above is not. This is current kernel stuff. And you can see, um, you should be able to see POSIX in, let's see. Yeah, so here, here's the POSIX one, and you can see POSIX here. So it's the server supported the negotiate context. This is mounting to Samba, and the client is requesting it by putting it on the mount. And, you know, we created four files with different modes, and you can see the different modes. We, you know, sending the mode bits correctly, the server retained them as you expected. When you had a rename, normally the rename would fail with, um, you know, if you had the file open, here I'm using tail to keep the file open with and without the POSIX extensions. With, with the POSIX extensions, the rename of the open file worked as expected. So here's another interesting topic, swift into a fun one. You know, SMB3 is not perfect. There are times when other protocols, specialized cluster protocols or NFS are 100 times faster for some specific thing. But I was sort of annoyed reading this because, I mean, we have a Mac developer here. There's times where, you know, it's really good. <laughs> like there's some really cool features that SMB3 offers. So when you Google this, this is my first hit. And it's like, really? Why is it so sad that Windows and Mac are forced to use a good protocol? Anyway, I, I was sort of amused at that. So I just like, you know, is it always faster? So I, you know, we sat at some test events recently and we we're like, I don't know, take the network out of the picture, just try read write stuff. I'd used FIO because FIO is a standard thing. I used the read write example. SMB was 12.5% faster than NFS was, Linux to Linux, same box. You know, no network involved, just local host. 12.5%, it was 12.8 for writes. For sequential, you saw a bigger difference, but, you know, there were cases where NFS was a lot faster too, but I just thought that FIO was kind of fun and large file copies were kind of fun. Um, DD, you know, I, you know, but what if we improved handle caching? What if all of Ronnie's code were in? So remember, just just those set of patches for those uh, the compounding got us faster for those two XFS tests. You know, I didn't measure those. That would have made a much bigger difference for some of these. But you know, what about the other cases? What if we do deferred close more? So anyway, it's going to be fun to do. I think we're going to enjoy some of these, uh, you know, performance things. But with RDMA, it gets spectacular because it's hard to imagine utilization this good, um, you know, than what we see over RDMA. And I'm really excited about that, especially as some of Tom Talpy's suggestions go in and some of the discussions Metz has had with Long Lee. But you know, there are cases where SMB is a lot faster. You know, here's another example, right? Um, we're doing various things. Uh, here's NFS. You know, here's a, we're, uh, here's DD copying files to and from. You know, we're seeing. Okay, so it's not not always, but in these examples we have here, it's quite a bit faster, 29% faster. So you know, here's another FIO one with a random read-write job, and 21% faster. A lot of work to do, a lot of performance work to do, but you know, I find it kind of exciting. Because for a lot of cases, even Linux to Linux, SAM is in user space. So is it, I mean, like, this is really cool. Even in user space, Linux to Linux, this can be really cool. Um, and not just to some specialized NetApp or Windows server. So what, what will help us? The compounding. So large file O, this looks really good. Let's get better on this. Um, being able to do lease upgrades. Um, right now, we only do direct releases for the root directory. We need to extend this. That'll help a lot. Uh, the handle caching, be able to cache across close, you know, the Windows client caches, you know, what we see in a lot of benchmarks where SMB gets cratered is create a temp file, close it, open it, where another file system doesn't send anything because they figure the timestamp hasn't changed, so let's just keep using the, the data we already cached, where SMB flushes it after the close, and on the next open, you know, if we, if we deferred close, uh, like Windows client does, then, you know, we'd get a thousand times faster for some common benchmarks. Um, 
And of course, you know, there are lots of cool features, the crediting and um, the copy offload features, the multi-channel that help a lot. But we do have work to do to finish off the implementation of some of these, not just multi-channel and not just the handle caching. There's a lot of little things we're discovering as we go case by case. And, but I'm most excited about the compounding work Ronnie's been doing because we find so many examples where one additional request sent cuts five or 10% performance better, you know? Really cool. So when is SMB good? Let's just net it out. Well, when you need nice security. I think no one's gonna argue that it's pretty cool that it's, you can mount securely over a crummy hotel network to Azure. When the performance with lots of large directories isn't an obstacle, with Ronnie's code in, um, you know, that isn't as much of an issue. Currently, if you depend on case sensitivity, you're gonna have to go into the configuration of your server and turn on case sensitivity because there's no way to specify it other than the way the Macs do until the POSIX extensions are in. So building the kernel, for example, requires case sensitivity because there's some duplicate file names. Um, you'd have to go, if you wanna build the kernel, turn an SMB conf parameter differently. Um, where is SMB3 great? Where you can take advantage of RDMA, where you can use the global namespace of DFS, where you can use snapshots and encrypted files and all these cool extra features. And then of course, I really enjoy cloud. Like I was telling you, my backup copy of my presentation is in Azure right now. So it's, I find it really cool that your Mac or your Windows, your, you, know, you can get at stuff so easily in the cloud through SMB3. I find that really fun. And I find it exciting, all of these changes, but we need a lot more testing. One of the things Aurelian has been talking a lot about is how to initiate automated testing and on check-ins allow people to be able to, um, to kick off a set of tests so we know that these patches are good because we got contributions for over 30 different developers from 20 different companies this year. Just, that's a lot. But how do we get these people comfortable that they're running the right tests and we don't regress? Because we had a couple of regressions in the last two releases. Um, so how do we improve the automated testing of this and get it closer to where Samba is? Anyway, I'm excited about this. I think the future is very bright and I'm hoping that we can talk more about the cool POSIX stuff at you know, the talk with Jeremy um, uh, in, I guess, four o'clock, right? Yeah. But in the meantime, we have to pass it off to, I think Volker is next, right? First break. First break, okay, and then Volker. Okay, let's go.